The number of coronavirus cases around the world is approaching a million. In the last half hour, we've heard that a further 758 people have died in hospital in India. India, the active cases stand at 2,650. The reported death toll of more than 16,000 seems to be an underestimate. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post. Here are some of the coronavirus stories, the media angles that we're covering from home this week. They say numbers don't lie. When you're tracking the pandemic, though, the numbers can mislead and misinform. Italy is now more than a month into its national quarantine. We speak with journalists there about the hits and misses in their coverage of COVID-19. The latest social media platform taking steps to stop the spread of coronavirus misinformation is WhatsApp. It's laying down some new rules. Plus, our new call of duty. Can you hear me? Hey guys. The conference call, and it's no video game. COVID-19 is a news story driven by the numbers. How many countries have been infected? How many people have it? How many have succumbed to the virus? What is the recovery rate? And is the curve flattening? And how quickly? The data helps journalists quantify the scale of this pandemic and allows news consumers to assess the risk. The numbers also inform governments on what measures they should take. But the next time you're looking at the numbers, consider this. Statisticians say that the way in which coronavirus data is collected, interpreted, and reported is inherently flawed. We're not talking about misinformation. We're talking about the limitations of science in the early stages of understanding a new virus and a new pandemic. Which means that much of the information currently available on the biggest news story in generations is at best uncertain and at worst misleading and dangerous. But it's all that journalists and the rest of us have to go on right now. Our starting point this week is the most widely reported component of the COVID-19 pandemic, the numbers. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus. Iran's single biggest jump in deaths, rising more than 100 to 724 overall. The coronavirus story is sweeping the world, creating a booming market for information. More than 132,000 officials. The ratings for news programs in India are up by more than 50%. In the UK, a reported 64% of Brits are watching more live TV, including news, than they did pre-lockdown. And evening newscasts in the US are seeing their highest ratings in 20 years. But are people getting news and numbers they can use? When they look at the data, the number of COVID-19 cases in South Korea seems high, twice that of India. But for every 1 million South Koreans, more than 7,500 have been tested. For every 1 million Indians, the number tested is just over 100. And that is just one example of how much of the data that we are consuming is inherently flawed. And so the data that we have on spread of the coronavirus is always a function of testing. And we know that the testing response has been very patchy. And yet I think that we still have seen a reliance on numbers which are informed by that huge failure to test and are weakened by it. And yet the numbers I think are presented with, with maybe more authority sometimes than, than they should be. They don't come with the proper asterisk uh, about uh, how biased they might be, how, how much off uh, these estimates uh, might have been. For example, the number of cases uh, is just the number of uh, people who have been documented to be infection, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, probably the, the true number of cases may be somewhere like 100 times bigger. And, and of course, that creates other huge inaccuracies, like, for example, what is the chance of dying if you get infected? Uh, if you have a, a very low denominator, which is the number of cases documented, uh, you will think that your risk of dying if you get infected is tremendous. But actually, if you correct that by uh, a hundredfold, more or less, uh, it, it becomes a very, very different story. President Trump, for example, talks about uh, the United States having tested more people than any other country. That may or may not be true. You know, the, the system of testing now is so quick and so easy. But what's relevant so is the per capita number of tests. And also, when they were administered, it doesn't do any good if um, they're, they're administered too late. So uh, all these factors, um, are important in the effect of fatality rate. 
I said the fatality rate, but there's, uh, there is no the fatality rate. There are various fatal fatality rates depending on these issues I mentioned. Not only do governments have to test, they have to be straight when reporting the numbers. North Korea claims it does not have a single case, despite a sizable outbreak across its southern border. That zero figure then gets plugged into global tracking platforms. Until pressured into changing its practices this week, China did not consider a positive test to be an official case unless the person tested showed symptoms as well. That skewed the statistics and cast doubt on Beijing's claims echoed throughout the Chinese media that the outbreak there is now under control. We have seen credible reports now that China is probably underreporting the number of people who were both diagnosed with this and who died. And so putting all those things together, I think it's really hard to have a reasonable discussion about what the death rate from this thing is. You know, this is something really useful for scientists, this is something really useful for policymakers, but it's likely to change. And I think our readers need to understand that, and we probably shouldn't be trying to convince them that it's exact right now. I think that we've seen the numbers reported in many democracies have not been especially reliable either. After three weeks of confinement, new numbers in France suggest the measures are working. I don't think that's necessarily attributable um, to malice or, or a desire to conceal, you know, the full extent of the problem, but it changes our understanding of the numbers. And yeah, I think the numbers are often presented in media coverage as these kind of monoliths, um, things that are sort of a true snapshot of the state of what's going on in any given place at, at a given time when it comes to this. Reporters are used to having science as an ally, an important tool in speaking truth to power. Science is what allows them, when reporting on climate change or economic stories, to counter political narratives and sound bites with cold, hard, indisputable facts. But that's only where the science is conclusive, and we're not there yet. In the last half hour, we've heard that a further 758 people who tested positive for coronavirus have died in hospital in England. Having won back some lost audiences, media outlets want to keep them, which means feeding them their daily dose of data. Let me now bring you the updated data as of now. In India, the active cases stand at 2,650. The death toll is at 68. The scientific process, however, takes time, and it has no more respect for the 24-hour news cycle than the coronavirus has for borders. I saw this happening a lot in March here in the US where we would have these news stories coming out daily talking about how many more new cases had been found. The number of cases soaring just today, more than 24,000 now nationwide. Hour by hour, the number of cases goes up and the deaths too. It's more than 160,000 cases in the United States, over 2,980 deaths. And I think a lot of people came away from that with this impression that all of the growth in diagnosed cases had to do with the speed of transmission and where it was going new, when what it actually was was these new states bringing their testing apparatus up online. And so we weren't testing yesterday, and now we're testing, and lo and behold, we found things. Looking at the broader issues and uh, the broader trends is more important than uh, biting your fingernails and looking every five minutes at uh, MSNBC or CNN in this country and around the world. And if you check uh, so frequently and so compulsively, then and tiny little uh, parochial vari variations, tiny little blips in the numbers uh, will assume uh, importance, uh, an importance that they, they don't have. It's not just the medical science that is coming up short right now. It's the science of economics. American banks trying to forecast how far U.S. gross domestic product will drop due to the pandemic are all over the place. Predictions from 10% to 40%. As one writer in The Atlantic magazine put it last week, that's not a sign of economists having an informed debate. It's a sign that economists have no idea what's going on, which puts them in the same category as journalists reporting on COVID-19 and the politicians deciding what to do about it. No one really knows. 
This is the part of the news story where the correspondent tends to say, but one thing is clear, or this much we know. But that scripting device doesn't really work with this story because there is so little that is clear. For a news industry based on facts, the trades in clarity, the coronavirus is like a plague of uncertainty. Get used to it because it's going to be like this for a while. I think that one of the things that we can really do as journalists that serves our readers, that serves ourselves, is to do what we can to help people be more comfortable with uncertainty. It's one of the greatest gifts that we can give to ourselves right now. It's something that's going to keep us from going crazy. And I think it's very important for journalists to be able to convey that uncertainty to the public, not instilling fear and panic, but uh, just telling them what we know and what are the boundaries of our knowledge uh, versus the boundaries of our uncertainty, because it, it's extremely important to differentiate these two. So uncertainty is the only certainty, and uh, learning how to live with uh, insecurity is the only security. And I think many people find that uh, kind of a uh, depressing uh, realization, but it's nevertheless the case. A demand for precision and, and certainty is just something that uh, science statistics isn't able to deliver. I think people have to resign themselves to the fact that we, we don't know right now. We won't know for a while. We're discussing other media and social media aspects of the coronavirus story with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, COVID-19 and misinformation, this is something that social media companies have been grappling with. Now WhatsApp is changing some of its rules. How and why? Well, Richard, earlier this week, WhatsApp announced that it is introducing a new limit on the number of times people can forward messages on the platform, all in an attempt to stop the spread of viral hoaxes and misinformation. Now, say either you or I receive a message on WhatsApp, one that has already been forwarded more than five times, you can now only send that message on to one other person. So what is worth noting is that it's a little bit of a soft limit because nothing stops you from then sending that same message to lots of different people. You just can't do it at the same time. So there's just a little bit more work and a little bit more clicks involved. What kind of misinformation is WhatsApp trying to stop here? Well, all sorts of bizarre stories have been spreading on the platform these past few months. For example, the idea that a coronavirus has somehow been caused by the new 5G mobile network, or that if you drink hot water every 15 minutes, you're miraculously cured of the disease. Now, the likes of Facebook and Twitter, they can flag this kind of content and then actually delete it. But because of WhatsApp's end-to-end -end encryption, it cannot take these messages down. And this wouldn't be the first time, would it, that this particular platform has hosted misinformation that might have some dangerous consequences? Well, exactly. Take, for example, India, which is actually WhatsApp's biggest market with more than 400 million users. Rumors and all sorts of misinformation has spread on the platform for the past few years. For example, rumors that people are alleged child abductors. And these kind of, uh, these kind of messages have actually led to a lot of mob lynching and uh, murders, which is why in 2018, WhatsApp announced that it was going to experiment with putting limits on the amount of times people can forward messages, putting it down from 250 to 20. Then in 2019, that number went further down to five. And now here we are, 2020, and the number is down to one. OK, thanks, Joe. Countries that are still climbing the coronavirus curve have been looking at places that are further along in order to see what's coming. Journalists who want to do that might want to take a long look at Italy. It was the second country after China to be gripped by COVID-19, the first in which the media are largely free of government control. The nationwide lockdown there has been in place for more than a month now, but the government has made an exception for reporters, deeming their work to be an essential service. And those journalists have had their work cut out from the start. Trust in the Italian news media had been at an all-time low. Nothing like a big news story for a chance to rebuild. A reputation. The Listening Post's Daniel Turi now in conversation with three Italian journalists, an investigative reporter, a newspaper editor, and a media analyst about the coverage of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. 
Empresa Directa is one of Italy's leading investigative programs, airing on the publicly owned channel Rai 3. Giulia Bosetti is a reporter on the program. Siamo all'ospedale maggiore di Parma e tutti i video che vedrete sono stati girati per noi dai medici. She told me about her investigation into the toll COVID-19 is taking on the Italian healthcare system. Un tema su cui sicuramente abbiamo puntato moltissimo. A subject we've focused on a lot is the fact that hundreds of thousands of Italy's doctors have been sent to fight this battle without the necessary protective gear. More than 60 Italian doctors have already died fighting this virus. And as their colleagues are continuing to fight it, I chose to tell the story through their voices. Not just by interviewing them, but letting them record their own stories, their own accounts of what it was like working in their wards. I patients can't receive visits from their own family, and so they often ask you to compose the number of the wife or the husband on their own cell phone, because they want to hear their voice for the last time. What have you thought when... Bosetti's film is just one example of some of the hard-hitting journalism that has been coming out of Italy over the past month or so. However, there have also been instances, and more than just a couple, of problematic media coverage. Mattia Ferraresi, thanks for joining us at The Listening Post. You wrote a piece for the American website, Neiman Reports, about the Italian media's reporting of the crisis. You criticised some news outlets for irresponsible journalism. What were some of the problems, in your opinion? I'll give you just an example. Uh, Il Corriere della Sera on March 8th, when the Italy first declared, the, declared its lockdown in the northern region of Lombardy, uh, published an early draft of the decree of the government that will lock down a whole region of 16 million people. That leak generated immediately a frenzy and according to a newspaper called Il Fatto Quotidiano, that like pushed 41,000 people to move around the country in a moment when it was absolutely crucial that people would respect orders and not move around to avoid spreading the virus. Giulia, something else Presa Diretta has been doing is debunking fake news about the coronavirus. Can you talk about some of the misinformation you've seen spreading around online and where it's coming from? In my opinion, there are two main strands of fake news that have been circulating. One is about fake cures. Buongiorno. Buongiorno, signori. Noi siamo qui a Mosca. There was a video we aired on our program showing two Italians using a medicine from Russia. Andiamo a comprare questo famoso Abidol contro tutti coronavirus. An antiviral that could apparently cure COVID-19 and that we in Italy didn't want to use it to treat people. Ma è veramente contro il coronavirus? No, si può dire che non è la cura per il coronavirus, è un antivirale. Even worse is when politicians publicize fake information. For example, the same day our program was broadcast, a Rai TV report from 2015 talking about a coronavirus created in a Chinese lab started circulating again. But it was about a completely different virus. It was spread all over social media. And then literally in the space of a few hours, Salvini, the leader of the Lega Party and our former deputy prime minister, actually asked a question in Parliament requesting it to be investigated, thereby committing our Parliament, which has so much to deal with right now, to look into something completely false. È lo stesso virus, quello di cui parla il servizio Leonardo del 2015? Naturalmente no. It took us only a few interviews with doctors and scientists to prove that it was totally fake news. Mattia, we've just been looking at some of the efforts Italian journalists are making to combat misinformation, but you've argued that that's not the whole story. You write, quote, journalists who thunder against misinformation occasionally contribute to it too. Explain what you mean by that. There is a tendency that I saw in, in the Italian media in these past few weeks to have their own narrative and wanting to push the facts 
into the narrative. And there was a great example, I think, in the newspaper La Repubblica, which is one of the major newspaper in Italy, accusing basically one company based in Italy that is producing swaps to sell swaps to the United States uh, at the expense of local hospitals who needs absolutely those swaps for testing. Uh, and, and so portraying a political struggle between sort of Italy and the United States was a, like a pretty significant accusation, but not, none of it was true. Uh, that company can produce like many more swaps than Italy need and can serve many markets. Questa sì, grazie. I spoke to La Repubblica's editor-in-chief, Carlo Verdelli, and I asked him to respond to the claim that his paper falsely implied that this sale of tests to the US deprived Italians of vital supplies. This wasn't a case of misinformation. That company acted in an absolutely legal way, and there isn't a single line in our newspaper alleging that they behaved in a fraudulent way towards the public. It's not the company's fault. It's the fault of a country that had not managed to put in place emergency procedures to supply hospitals with the equipment Italians needed at that time. It's that simple. Before this crisis began, La Repubblica was already one of Italy's most widely read newspapers. What kind of impact has the coronavirus had on your paper? As far as our website is concerned, with our minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour reporting, we've had a huge increase in traffic. Before the coronavirus, we averaged around 3 million unique visitors a day. Now, on our busiest days, we reach 14 to 15 million visitors, and we are averaging around 10 million unique users per day. So our online audience has tripled. As for printed copies, at the beginning of the epidemic in Italy, we recorded a significant increase in sales. However, since then, thousands of newsstands have closed, and so sales have leveled out. Those record audience figures are not unique to La Repubblica. With 60 million Italians locked indoors, most, if not all, of Italy's mainstream news outlets are enjoying a similar spike. The pandemic has paused what had been a long period of decline for traditional media in Italy, which many Italians no longer trust to tell the truth. This report by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism found that as of last year, just one third of Italians thought the media was doing a good job of scrutinizing the powerful. But some hope the COVID-19 lockdown and the literally captive audience it provides is a chance for a reset. In the last few years in Italy, there's been a lot of hostility towards the news media. This is the moment when television journalism, and print as well, can regain the trust of their listeners and readers by offering up different kinds of journalism. Daily updates with the latest facts and figures, including the number of deaths, but also reporting that tries to understand the root of the problems we now face, as well as starting to look at the problems that are heading our way. In a time when the country needs to stay united, we also need to keep scrutinizing those in power, something we must not forget in a moment like this. And finally, stuck at home, working out of our living rooms, people are spending hours and hours in virtual meeting rooms. A few years back, one video conferencing platform, Zoom, hired an American comedy duo called Trip and Tyler to produce an ad on its behalf, showing some of the pitfalls of conference calls, the freeze frames, the audio glitches, the weird camera angles, intruding children and pets, at least some of which the Zoom platform is designed to conquer. Zoom's business is booming these days, but there are some serious concerns about its privacy settings and security policies. So the next time you dial into a work meeting or your yoga class or even a virtual night out, might be worth asking yourself, who else is on the call, quietly taking notes? We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hey, Paul. Thanks for being here on time. Paul? Hey, Paul, can you hear me? I can't hear you. 
I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, guys. Oh, hey, Tyler. Sorry I'm late. I'm having a hard time connecting. One second. Paul's having a sound issue. I can't hear you. Try adjusting your output settings. Can you it's hear the, me? It's the gear icon. Tyler, are you on hotel Wi-Fi? Yeah, why? Hey, Beth. Hey, everyone. Sorry I'm late. I had to download a new version of the platform. You should plan extra time for the updates. There's pretty much one every time. Sounds like someone just joined. Hey, guys, it's John. Um, I had to call in. I'm stuck in traffic. Have I missed anything yet? All right, while everyone is here, finally, uh, Tyler, do you have that financial report? Well, it's been the last few weeks updating our books, and I got some great news for you. Schedule from this point last year. We had a great Q1. We lost Tyler, I think. Am I frozen? Hey, Trip, I think we lost Tyler. Yeah, I know. All right, everybody. I'll see you later.